first of all, I really, I'm so grateful that there's so many people listening, you know, on Zoom, listening to a talk, and I feel very embarrassed because my talk is about spirit and petrography, you know, fabrics, incorporation of selected trace element. I mean, it's not a sexy talk. And I, I always think like, why did I do that? Why I don't talk about more intriguing topics like black, hole, black holes, time and space, gravity, life and death. And I, when I was a kid, I was actually attracted by astronomy, but then my parents told me that I needed a job. So I became a geologist. And because I like tiny, tiny little things and details, I was extremely intrigued about the structure of minerals and in particular carbonates. And, and carbonates, because they are somehow evolving with the universe, they are complex because because they are strictly related to life. I mean, so organisms build their home or skeleton with carbonates. So what I can only offer you is, I hope something cool, and it's just diving into the complex universe of crystallization pathways in carbonates. And because carbonates are so complex, our understanding, even on their fabric and trace element partitioning is far from being definitive, but our knowledge is evolving. And I would like to stress evolution because it was, it's what always drives me. If I am wrong, for example, I admit I am wrong. It's part of the evolution of science. So where does this come from? It comes from when I was a student at Berkeley and I found this secondhand book <laughs> in a bookstore and I still treasure that book is Dana's System of Mineralogy. It's got beautiful images of mineral, but it's a systematic classification of crystals. Um, and Dana wrote, this is in the 1850, he wrote, chemistry has opened to us a better knowledge of the nature and relationship of compounds and philosophy has thrown a new light on the principle of classification. To change is always seemingly fickleness, but not to change with the advance of science is worse. It is persistent in error. So that's what I try to avoid. And I embrace change. And so how I, I, mean, it, I I've explore new things and I explore also new fabrics, for example. So how has the science of crystallization evolved? Uh, we are familiar with the concept uh, summarized by Sunagawa in 2005, which is, plan is referred to in the book by Fairchild and Baker, Speed of Science. And the concept of crystal growth here is a function of an increasing driving force. And the driving force, when you think of speedotherms, is the supersaturation because pyrothermic crystal grow from a solution, a, a fluid. And the driving force, so here is your driving, increasing driving force. And through increasing, in this case, the supersaturation, you change the form. So you change the form of the crystal, you change the morphology. And accordingly, you change the fabric, which is how the crystals are arranged in a speed of time. So you can go from the spiral growth, which is this one. So it grows like steps revolving around what's called a screw dislocation, then to what is called two dimensional nucleation and growth through adhesive time. So the passage is flat faces to stepped and kinked faces to dendrites to spherulites. Fortunately, spirotherms, the driving force in caves, is almost in the field of 
spiral growth. So the trace element incorporation should reflect such mechanism, trace and minor element incorporation. But the science of crystallization has evolved. And for carbonates, it's evolved with people investigating biomineralization. And the biomineralization means organism precipitate and the mineral. Then there is bioinduction or bioinfluence, where there is an influence of the organism, but it's not direct. So here, uh, and this is has been very well summarized by the Oreo and others in 2015. This is a science paper. Many other possible crystallization pathways. So this is the monomer by monomer, and the monomer by monomer uh, is like atoms of molecules attaching at st step and kings uh, in, on this spiral. And in the end, you get a growing bulk crystal. In Carbonates, we have documented other types of growth, which are common in other types of minerals. The most important is you could have amorphous nanoparticle, meaning there's no lattice, it's like glass, and they attach to each other, create an amorphous phase, and then through dissolution the precipitation, this transform into your usual bulk crystal with flat faces, for example. Then you could have poorly crystalline nanoparticles, meaning you can have part of it is amorphous, part of it is a nanocrystal, so it's got a lattice, then they attach to each other, uh, to each other. the attachment could be a little bit messy, and, and, and then they dissolve again, and the final product is your usual crystal. And then you can also have the attachments of nanocrystal. So they are little, tiny, tiny, tiny little crystal, like two nanometers. And again, they could attach each other. The attachment could be perfectly oriented, so the lattice is continuous, or slightly mid-match, the mismatch. So you could have something that goes in between, like organic matter, for example. And then again, you could have the solution, the reprecipitation, and the deformation of your usual beautiful bulk crystal. So this is science that is advancing a lot because there are, uh, because one of, I mean, some of these pathways are called non-classical nucleation and growth. Now, do we see these in, in inorganic carbonates? We do. And uh, the, the first time I actually documented that is in dolomite, because I'm also interested in dolomite. Uh, it's been a problem around for 200, uh, two, 200 years, and I thought it, it's really a very cool problem. Um, when you look at dolomite, which at the microscope, it's darker because it's composed of many tiny, tiny microscopic crystals called aphanitic dolomite. You could see with normal transmission electron microscope that there are crystals that look like salt and pepper. So they are full of these locations. When you start looking at those with a high resolution transmission microscope, meaning you start lattice imaging to so see the lattice of the crystal, then in this case, they are composed of many nanocrystals. And the lattice uh, is slightly mismatched. Now, this thing is to un over 200 million years old. Nanocrystals are still persisting, which is bizarre, because they shouldn't. I mean, they are tiny. So through Oswald step rule, uh, through, sorry, Oswald ripening, they should dissolve and form a larger crystal. The reason why they are still there it's probably because there is organic matter breaching them and also sort of protecting them from dissolution so they can still preserve. Fantastic. One of the reasons why they are there for dolomite is because dolomite is the double carbonate of calcium and magnesium. The problem with magnesium is to have, you have to dehydrate it before you put it into a carbonate crystal is not compatible. So in order to do that, you, it, this requires energy. And 
this is a very smart way somehow lower the interfacial energy. And I will talk about that further in the talk when we go to spiritons. So what crystallization pathways act in spiritan carbonates? So what, at least what did we, what did we document? And in order to be even, to, to sort of make things easier, I'm just going to uh, tackle the most common fabrics, the columnar calcite, which are the most common fabrics you all find in most uh, speedotems. So according to Frisia 2015 classification, a columnar fabric, you could have a compact columnar, which is this one, looks translucent on a slab, polished stalagmite slab, and open. And the open columnar is characterized by the fact that it's got the vertical voids between the crystals. Notice I say between the crystals. If you look with the scanning electron microscope at the top of, of, of these uh, columnar crystals, you notice that they have flat faces. So this is consistent with Sunagawa model, relatively low supersaturation. And in fact, uh, the idea is that columnar fabric are largely dominated by flat faces and they form as uh, for low to moderately saturated drip waters and a pH, which is from 7.6 to 8.2, something like that. So these crystals are predicted to grow through the, screw, uh, through the spiral growth mechanism, right? And it's true because if you look with the transmission electron microscope, you find that there are a few dislocations. At the optical microscope, uh, just to uh, stress the difference, this is compact, so no porosity. And here is a laminated example, and this is open. So this is a crystal, this is crystal, and in between there are voids, vertical and elongated along the direction of speleothem growth. And the arrows point to the fact that the surfaces, the lateral surfaces are rugged, so they are kinked. So on, on those kinks of steps, you can sort of attach uh, organic compounds. They would stick there and prevent the calcite to grow and then to close the voids. Now, Spiral is not so easy. The way it acts, it creates sector zoning. So I, I wanted sort of to focus a bit or spend time on sector zoning for everyone to understand hopefully. So columnar and open um, fabrics growing by this mechanism, the spiral growth, have this growth, it looks on the surface of the flat faces, which are commonly the one over one four and the zero one bar one two. What are these growth illogs? Well, they are little tiny illogs that uh, grow uh, through this spiral mechanism on the surface. And because of the symmetry of calcite, what happens is that we have four vicinal faces. Two of them are characterized by obtuse steps, steps that are a larger than 90 degree. And two of them, called the minus, so these are the plus and these are the minus, are acute steps, so less than 90 degree. So the idea is that the ions larger than calcium go into the obtuse step and ions smaller than calcium go into the acute step. So you form sectors, you preferentially accommodate, for example, strontium here and magnesium there. It doesn't always work because zinc doesn't work like that, 
but it's a very good approximation and it does work. Now, this is sector zoning, but there's also something called intrasector zoning. So how do we form intrasector zoning? Again, this is your, these are your, this is your growth inlock. This is the plus obtuse steps, and this is the minus acute steps. The acute steps form because of the orientation of the CO3 groups, and it's the same for the obtuse steps. So I told you, it's a muscle of symmetry of the structure of the mirror. Now, on this side, the acute, you preferentially put magnesium. So Davis and others in 2004 started, uh, they, they carried out experiments with the atomic force microscope and they, were, they looked at the effect of putting more and more magnesium in the solution to see what happens to the growth in looks. And so, Imagine this, magnesium would go here, where you have the acute steps. So you put more and more magnesium here, it won't go here, and you start creating a distortion in your growth. And, the, this, and this part will keep going on uh, so normally. The distortion will become so, uh, so much that the, the, the steps uh, will get a different orientation. And at that stage, depending whether the angle is acute or obtuse, you put, might put more magnesium into that. And you start also deforming the morphology of the crystal in such a way that the crystal, the columnar crystal becomes more and more and more elongated. So this is the reason why when you have columnar elongated calcite in spirit terms, you could go like, oh, there must be a lot of magnesium in it. For a lot, it could be a thousand ppm, but it's a measure of the fact that you have magnesium. And why magnesium actually changes the fabric. So sectoral and intrasectoral zoning, they are typical of these flat faces, which we find in columnar fabrics. And they are sort of, you know, you attach monomer by monomer, so ion or molecules to steps or kings. And these are, your, these are your flat faces. So this is your standard cleavage rhomboedron is one of the most common form you find. There is a slight problem in, in it, which De Paolo pointed out in 2011. He said, well, for sector zoning to occur, the surface layer of the calcite crystal must be in equilibrium with the solution during growth. And this occurs for very slow growth. Hmm. Also, it is, a, it is a, the condition of the oversaturation of the fluid. So if you have too much supersaturation, then the surface is not in equilibrium with the solution. And as Nicholas has pointed out just before me, if you start having a lot of the gas and you increase and increase and increase the supersaturation at the surface of the growing crystal, it's all a matter of surface. Now, do we see sector and intrasector zoning in, in speed? We do. Dysland and others 2012 and 2019 by looking at a very slowly growing uh, spirotem in Laghetto Basso, which is in Cortia Cave in Tuscany, and by painstakingly carried out a series of raster of laser ablation, ICP, EMS, um, trace element analysis, found out 
that strontium and barium have a different distribution relative to magnesium. Now, in this specific, in the, the water in Laghetto Basso have a pH of 8.2, uh, medium supersaturation, 0 0.2, medium low, but importantly, a low ionic strength. So there's no competition by other ions in solution. The second, uh, the second example is um, work with a lot, implying a lot of different microscopic um, techniques plus laser ablation mapping. And is as Levinsky installed 2000, uh, 2021. And they document pretty well that there is a preferential incorporation of magnesium and sodium in what they call spires. And they, they also document that these spires are associated to fluorescence, so organic matter goes in there, which is really cool. Because if you remember my dolomite, I told you that magnesium needs to be dehydrated and the organic matter can do that. Now, for strontium, it's a little bit fuzzier. It seems to go preferential where the magnesium isn't, but it can also go where the magnesium is. And the other th thing that they show is cathode luminescence, and they use it simply to sort of understand where they could have more or less crystal defects. But the most important thing here is that they document this sort of spire distribution of magnesium and sodium definitely in spires, which are correlated with fluorescence. So there is a takeaway message, both of these studies, which states that magnesium and strontium show heterogeneity in the lateral concentration distribution in speedotems. Elements incorporation indeed seems to be influenced by sector and intrasector zoning, a fabric effect. Laghetto basso, it, and this is part of the complexity of spirotem, as the highest partition coefficient for magnesium observed so far in spirotems. It's really high. So Dryston and other in 2019, I mean, 0.042, it should be 0.01. They consider several hypotheses, including nucleation effects. So they actually hint to the fact that monomer by monomer of growth might not be satisfactory. And I sort of applaud this. It's really good because it will take me then to the next step. Strontium, by contrast, has a normal partition coefficient as expected, 0.1. It, it, which is within the range value observed in case studies. Now, the takeaway message specific of Slivinsky and Stoll is the lateral distribution of an element also depend on its affinity for colloidal organic and particulate matter, as well as the element's ability to dissociate from its colloidal host, which is the work Adam Arkland is carrying out and looking into that. And the disruption of the ionic hydration spheres by dissolved organic matter. And I point out also organic matter, not necessarily just dissolved, also stuff that might be on the speedotem, because we know that on speedotems we could have bacteria. This facilitates the partitioning of magnesium, for example, into the calcite lattice, then we also know that absorption and desorption of magnesium also slow the growth rate. So magnesium is really a very complicated ion. 
So we really need to take into consideration all these, and I don't think I will be exhaustive enough to explain that because I don't know many of the processes that are going on. Now, one, just to mention growth right. Now that of partitioning at growth right is also one of the points people are discussing about for spirotan incorporation, for example, of strontium. We know that Wassenburg and others in 2020 wrote that growth right is not influencing the incorporation of strontium in spirotans in a variety of environmental and climate settings. So I found this paper quite interesting, Gabitov and other 2021. They evaluated the partitioning of some elements, including magnesium and strontium on two flat phases of calcite, O1 over 1,4 and O1 over 1,2, through a growth entrapment model plus. They took into consideration a very difficult concept, which is so a diffusivity. The diffusivity, because an ion somehow has to travel on the surface of calcite to get to the site, you know, so it travels on the step surface to get to attach to the step and kink sides, which requires energy. So they explain the distribution of magnesium and strontium as due to the fact that magnesium preferentially goes in the acute step, so sector zoning. And the same is true for strontium. And the different diffusivity between strontium and magnesium. So there is a competition at a certain point between the growth rate and the different solid state diffusivity of these atoms. And remember, magnesium is hydrated. So in just in, in very, very sort of sim simplifying things, if you look at the magnesium, you see that the growth rate effect, it's not very much. I mean, the distribution of magnesium appears to be very similar on the, on the one over one four and on the O, one but one two, regardless to the growth rate. But for strontium is slightly different. For the whole one over one four, it's almost the same, but for the O one but one two, there is a there is a growth effect. And this again is due to this complexity at the surface. Now when they talk, Gabitov and other talk about diffusion, they talk about solid state diffusion. Solid state diffusion is something which happens on the, I would say at the, like one atomic scale, because it's very slow. Strontium would not move in solid state. So here again is Di Paolo saying it's not solid state. So it's not in the solid crystal, it's at the interface between the, the, the solid and the fluid. There is a diffusivity boundary. This is a great idea. So because, I, because there are so many kinetic barriers to growth and all these kinetic barriers are at the surface, or most of these kinetic bodies are at the surface. So everything depends on the surface of calcite, in the case of calcite, obviously. So classical it's a, it's attachment, detachment, diffusion of ions on, at the, on the mineral surface are dependent on the surface energy. And what I was telling you about, you know, like you have an atom, add atoms, so it's, goes into the surface, then this atom has to travel a little bit to get to its growth size. So that's not a piece of cake. 
And the classical monomer by monomer growth implies that atoms diffuse near surface to get to the growth site that diffused through this boundary layer, not solid state. It would be too slow. When you are in the boundary layer, then strontium has the right velocity, <laughs> the right diffusivity, let's call it like this. So strontium sometimes would go faster. And in fact, the partition coefficient of strontium is larger than that of magnesium. So strontium is somehow sort of it, it more, it, it's more compatible with calcite than magnesium. Compatibility means that, you know, an incompatibility means that your partition coefficient is below zero, and which is the case of strontium and magnesium, and compatible when it's above zero. So this might explain why in certain cases, there might be a dependency of some trace elements such as strontium and growth rate. Again, it's a matter of surface. So I said, many kinetic barriers. I said, oh, but crystals are, are smart. Yeah, I'd like to sort of make a crystal more humane, but <laughs> allow me to do that. So crystallization is smart ways to overcome the energy barriers. And one of the smarter ways was already picked up by Oswald in, I think it's in the 1800s or something, a long time ago. And it's Oswald step rule, not the ripening. Ripening is just a smaller crystal become bigger. This is Oswald, Oswald ripening. The step rule is very different. The step rule says that in a system, it's the phase with the lowest kinetic energy that forms first. This is a sort of a re, uh, rewording of Oswald's step rule by Patrick Meister in an accepted paper. So the lowest kinetic energy, most of the time, pertains to a metastable phase. So rather than forming calcite or dolomite, we form an amorphous calcium carbonate on, or an amorphous calcium magnesium carbonate. And then this would transform into your order at crystal. And Wassenburg and other ex actually hinted at possible effects of trace element partitioning due to the occurrence of unstable calcium carbonate precursor because they do exist. They have been precipitated in the lab, but they discarded this hypothesis on the basis that experiments were performed at higher supersaturation and pH than those typical of cave water. Now, that's not really true because in cave experiments, so by putting a TEM grid in a beaker, immersing it in drip water in a cave, so there wasn't much degassing, it was totally immersed, I precipitated an unstable phase, vasserite, and it remained stable until I reached the transmission electron microscope. Why? Because, of ca because cave water are full of organic matter. And how did this vasserite, was, how did it grow? Well, apparently, it grew by the attachment of nano-aragonite particles. So particles of less than four nanometers created a vasserite of over a hundred nanometer. And then this vasserite puff attached itself on a growth site, it dissolves, becomes calcite. And the fabric that creates, it creates, it's not your beautiful columnar calcite fabric, it's a fabric, it's columnar, but full of pores. And in most of the pores, you have organics, and it's not 
just organic matter. It's probably bacteria and fungi. So that's life as, as a component of bio-induced crystallization. Bio-induced, meaning that everything is inorganic. The bio biological part is just facilitating crystallization, nucleation and growth, and facilitating the fact that uh, unstable phases could remain. And Demi and other also precipitated amorphous calcium carbonate in Baradlakev. So we do have those, and this is Ostwald step rule. Now, Ostwald step rule, so we need, uh, it is again, provides you with, um, provides the crystal with a way to lower kinetic barriers. And Meister, again, highlights the fact that at the nanoscale, the low interfacial energy barrier of amorphous and even crystalline nanoparticles may favor growth, particularly when you have a lot of magnesium around. So nanocrystalline nanoparticle attachment might be a natural pathway if they can lower this, so we get to here. So we saw it in dolomite, and do we see it in spiriotensin? Now this part, the attachment of this nanoparticle, is part of this co new complex called non-classical nucleation and growth. And it's debated by people, but it's a mechanism a lot of people didn't believe in, and it's more and more being documented to occur. This, um, just to show that it does happen in calcite, and re just remember this photo, this is an experiment carried out by Rodriguez Navarro and other 2016 to just look at how calcite grows. If it can grow for this non-classical mechanism. And they form overgrowth on acidic crystal. And the, if you look with the high resolution transmission microscope, you see that these overgrowth, which as you know, like this is the o, your usual O1 by one four phase. In reality, the crystal consists of nanocrystals. Same thing we found in the dolomite. But there is more. They also documented that you see these little blobs. These are particles of amorphous calcium carbonate, and they attach to the step of this spiral growing, this phase of growing through step, advancing step on spire, and then they transform into calcite. So we do have this complex mechanism of growth. Do we see it in caves? So here is me doing my cave experiment and trying to precipitate uh, carbonate from the repulsor. So one of the first experiments I did was in a cave in Australia, in Yarangubili, and the, which forms a stalagmite again that have this very fuzzy fabric. The columns do not have straight boundaries. They are not open. It's not open columnar. The pores are within the crystals, not between. So I call it columnar pores. It's a different type of fabric. And the, the, the boundaries between the crystal are interfinger, are, are strange. I used to call it a columnar microcrystal line. The problem why I sort of dropped for this the microcrystal line is that I didn't look at these specific fabrics with the transmission electron microscope. So I don't know if they are full of this location, but that's part of the evolving uh, story of fabrics. So let's call it columnar porous. How, do, how does it form? 
now from the drip water and the vision um, from the vision again it's uh, it, it was one of my first experiments it's published it's in freezing out of 2018 in the water i precipitated both nanocrystals and the crystal you see the lattice so this is a crystal part portion but then there are also the black dots which are organics so the crystal seems to be associated with some organic particulate that it's around in the drip water and then they start at being attracted to each other and start to uh, attach so nanoparticles associated to organic compounds the idea is well could it be that this kind of grow is what actually gives this fabric uh, let's go on and and i went to a cave where um, adam is working rambling guts in new zealand whilst uh, we were working together on some experiments and I mean Adam was and Pearson one of his students was doping um, the in the lab was doping the fluid with several types of organic matter I just went into the cave and said okay what happens in the cave world and if you look at my image of calcite crystal precipitated on the TEM grid, it's very similar to what the Rodrigo Wetz Navarro and other 2016 had found in the lab. So it's crystal formed by nanocrystal. Then at the TEM, you can also, uh, you have an EDX, so you can also look at the composition. And what was uh, striking is that you have a lot of phosphorus. So I don't know, maybe phosphorus is related to organic compounds. So it's there and it might be that the organic compounds, again, are helping you, to, are, are helping the nanocrystal to the mismatch, the mismatchment of the lattice. Uh, they are bridging it because there is a slight lattice mismatch, but again, Nanocrystal can precipitate from water collected at a low drip rate with a pH of ice and, and um, Adam just told me that the saturation is very low. So this could happen even a very low supersaturation. It's probably just a way to decrease the energy of nucleation and growth. Now, what's the fabric? The fabric is columnar porous. It's full of tiny, tiny little pores, again, between the crystal, not within. So that's why it's a different fabric. And, and it probably grows through different mechanisms, maybe not just one. Maybe it could grow by a classical way and a non-classical way. So columnar poros, non-classical, classical growth pathway, and what's the implication for you who are studying paleoclimate, looking at trace sediment distribution? Oh, well, I mean, first of all, you see a fabric with pervasive, uh, pervasive porosity. Then what you see is that sometimes it even got like some stromatolytic look like, looking like features. So, you might think that there is organic, um, there are organic compounds and there could be even bacteria around, but the most important thing is look at where the porosity is. And uh, uh, like in 2017 with Veronica Chiarini looking at some stalomite for Bos Bosnia, we already had the idea, which is illustrated in this graph and you notice the tiny, tiny little crystal, a slightly mismatch with the voids. At that time, I didn't even consider non-classical pathway exactly. Then I stepped into what's called mesocrystal, and they look exactly the same. So you have lots of nanocrystal arranged together, and in between you have organic matter. So that's a very nice way to entrap the organic matter into your calcite. It doesn't go in the lattice, it goes between nanocrystals. 
No, Veronica look, uh, very roughly looked with just scan, one laser ablation scan at the distribution of trace element according to fabrics. And what is neat is that the strontium actually prefers to go in the compact calcite, the one that grows with the spiral growth, and magnesium prefers to grow in the open, uh, no, sorry, in the porous. Hmm. So it does make sense. And so if in the porous you have organics, magnesium goes with in the organics. And, and here we are. We go back again to what Slavinsky and Stoll have shown us, that magnesium and organ uh, magnesium seems to be associated where organics go. So the story seems to be true. It's a rough data set, but you know, it's an idea. So do I have anything more robust? I have this example. I'm, I'm just showing something that has been published because I know that this goes on YouTube. <laughs> so the, this example is, was published by Wong and others 2019, and it is a stalagmite in Laos. And it's GOS, it's your columnar poros, which is the one which is very milky, and columnar compact, which is the one more translucent. And guess what? With the synchrotron, uh, Andrea Borsato took a synchrotron map, and now the Australian synchrotron, unfortunately, uh, to date, uh, cannot analyze magnesium because the, ex the energy is too strong. It analyzes strontium. So you have only the strontium map to show. But strontium here appears to go preferentially in the compact and less preferentially in the poros. So the poros looks darker. And there is no clear sector zoning for strontium. And so, so what, what is sort of the, the message I'm trying to convey? The message is there are different crystallization pathways giving you different fabrics, which somehow impart a different behavior to the trace element incorporation partitioning within these fabrics. So I try to summarize stealing, uh, stealing the slide from one of Andrea's talk. I think he gave it a sizem. What I believe now are the controlling factors of trace element incorporation, specifically strontium and magnesium. For growth rate, I think that magnesium does have a slight, in, in for strontium, sorry, it does have a slight effect, at least for one of the flat phases. So it's a plus. Step king side defects, it's another plus. The more steps you have when magnesium could go, so the larger and more obtuse step, uh, sorry, strontium, strontium would go there. Diffusion and ion mobility is another thing that helps strontium. Strontium can be very fast in, it's fast enough in this, uh, in this boundary layer. Particle attachment, I still don't know. In my opinion, for what the data I have so far, there is no difference between particle attachment and spiral growth in the way, in the amount of incorporation of strontium. Because if you have nanoparticle attachment and the nanoparticles are calcite, the, this, the partition coefficient of strontium would be the same as for the bigger crystal. Dissolved organic matter or organic matter in general seems to be a deterrent. So the strontium does not like it. For magnesium, the growth rate doesn't seem to be important. That's not temporary, it's growth rate. Step king side defects, yes, it's important. It could help magnesium, but until magnesium, it 
it's too much and retards, it starts retarding the ground. So absorption, desorption, absorption, desorption. Again, diffusion and ion mobility because magnesium needs to dehydrate, takes time to do it, attaches slower than strontium. Now, for magnesium, I believe, I say I believe that amorphous calcium carbonate nano, uh, nanoparticles or nanocrystal attachment could actually help magnesium to go into the calcite lattice. So maybe it's a plus. And organic matter, definitely it uh, is a plus because it helps dehydration. The, take -home, so the last take home message is, is, it is because of all these complexities, the best thing to do is to rely to your trace elements and minor element distribution parti partitioning to your specific case study. Via monitoring, as Nicholas just said, monitoring is important. The use of compilation in paper, it's okay, but it has a risk. The risk is that compilation picks up many different examples. And this example may have grown with all kinds of growth processes. So this goes all in the same basket and may actually sort of cancel what really is the, the, the mechanism or what really are the mechanism you have and how the incorporation of, of important paloclimate and uh, trace element occur. Monitoring as some, as question arose about how long should it be? What if you have a cave which is like, like in our case, like in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean and you cannot go there all every month and you might not have people helping you or it's risky to have people helping you because they are not, they don't know very well what this is all about and perhaps they collect the wrong water or they think like, why should I do that? I collect the water from the river rather than staying like hours to collect the water from the drip. Um, at least I think it's good to have an idea of the pH and if you can of the saturation index in two seasons, like the wet and dry, but warm and cold. Now, Attempt to farming calcite, as Nicholas said, but if you cannot even do that, then I think that a good practice compatible with the local, uh, the local uh, laws and, and ethical sampling is that you collect a few chips from near the tip, uh, near the drip point of your of stalagmites fed by different drip rides. So you also monitoring, monitor the drip rides. And, and then, or at least the selected two with different drip rides. Handle everything with surgical gloves so that you don't put anything coming from your fingers. Then put and wrap everything in aluminum foil and store it in a cooler. And then, as soon as you can, observe the surface with the scanning electron microscope. If you have a scanning electron microscope with variable energy pressure, it's best so you don't have to coat the sample because coating could induce some artifacts. But anyway, do the best you can. And as I said, for the parent waters, if you can analyze at least the pH, that would be great. Uh, whatever you can do, sometimes you know, then you can, you have to work out your, your saturation index and you have, you know, Adam probably will talk to you about and, and uh, in Slavinsky install, you also find what 
what programs you can use. So there's a lot around on how, how to model. But uh, then, once you've monitored, once you have your standard mind, look at the most common fabric. So um, don't think that you have to sort of destroy your stalagmite by carrying out thin section throughout the old stalagmite. If you just have two or three fabrics, take a thin section of those. And always try to pitch your chemical data with the fabrics once you actually know a little bit more about how they form. And after this talk, you have an idea. And know that Everything is complicated, but at least the fabrics, and now there is a lot of reference about fabrics, give you an idea of how they grow, so how the environment is. Know that uh, the crystallization pathway are complex, but if you find that the top of your speed of them have flat faces, then hop, it's viral glow. So you know that if you find, you're probably bound to find a heterogeneous trace element distribution. So it would be nice if you map the trace elements. And this is dictated by sector and intersector zoning. If the surface is more messy, you're bound to find heterogeneous lateral distribution, which might have more, uh, more of these non-classical pathways. Now, learn a bit more about crystallochemistry if you wish, and familiarize yourself with nano-investigation, because this seems the future in many fields of research, not just the spirit and science. Now, I finished. I have to acknowledge a loss S4 online. Thank you for having invited me. And it's so nice to see all these young people, lots of new faces, people I don't know. Thanks to the University of Newcastle for still hosting me. And thanks to Andrea Borsato for all the kind monitoring, all the help it always gives me. And then people uh, working uh, at the electron microscopy unit, people who carried out the, the trace elements analysis, Patrick Meister who allowed me to show his graphs, uh, Veronica, Adam, and the, the person who actually depicted me as a penguin. And thank you so much for listening to my story. Remember, there is a lot much to do, and I really hope that some of you will contribute to evolve the science of spirit and crystallization pathways and fabrics, because I'm old. Thank you. All right, let's all thank Sylvia for, I think, an excellent talk. So chock full of information. <laughs> and I'm trying have... to stop. Oh, no, I shouldn't stop share, right? Until um, the. It's up to you. I don't know. Uh, okay, um, I can I can leave it on, and I have to remember to stop a bit. And if I, yeah, okay, remind me. <laughs> we can kick you off if you if you forget. Um, <laughs> okay, so we have a few minutes for questions. So feel free to drop them in the chat or raise your hand. Well, I had a bunch of questions written out and then your um, conclusion slide answered a lot of them, honestly. Um, so I'm guessing, oh, here we, here we have a question from Adam. He said, what about inorganic colloids? What about inorganic? Inorganic colloids. Uh, and what does, what about? Me. Ah, you mean like what their um, contribution could be? Yes, I think so. I think it's the stuff he has to talk about. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I mean, well, yes. I actually found, for example, in Tandumai, uh, which I didn't show because it's unpublished stuff, the colloids are mostly consisting of silica. So there is a competition. So the pores, rather than having organic compounds, 
seem to have amorphous silica that then somehow dissolves, and then I don't know what happens. Um, so in these inorganic colloids, uh, you know, like if you have silica, they could like silica, aluminum, potassium, etc. Well, you could have magnesium and strontium in them. And, and then they could, once they dissolve, they could potentially contribute because there's a little tiny spheres of, uh, in, they are actually spheros, uh, nanospheros. They do attach to the kink and step size of the calcite. So they clog a growth site, but then they dissolve and the trace element, at least the those who can go into the calcite, might probably go into the calcite. This is the only thing I know, or I have documented. I haven't studied that a lot. One of the things which I think we over sort of oversee a lot is more the inorganic part, uh, sorry, the organic part. And especially the fact that, I mean, or, the organic is ubiquitous, not just in caves. Um, and, and that's why, I mean, my first example was of a dolomite. And I also know that in the dolomite, for example, dolomite, a dolomite formation, the nanocrystal of dolomite seem to be helped in by, by nano clay. So I'm really, I think I'm really not adequate enough to answer the question. <laughs> Well, sounds like we're going to hear more in. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I was looking over my list of questions and there is one. So for someone who's like brand new to petrography, you had a good list of like tips of places to start, but say you have just um, you, you just have a brand new sample. Um, what would be your recommendation? Like right off the bat, what to do with that sample? As far Meaning as you just know. you just have one brand new sample and you have no monitoring, nothing. Maybe you took some monitoring when you were there. You go to the cave oh, for the okay. first time, collect your first monitoring data. You come back to the lab, slice open your sample, and boom, you have a new sample. What's your recommendation to start? Yeah. With? Oh boy, that's a very tricky one because I know now that a lot of people if, when you published paper, they require you to have at least the two samples, right? So uh, let's suppose that you just have one sample because you went into, I don't know, an exceedingly difficult place and then you were told you could not take away more than one stalagmite. So then you are stuck by logistics and, 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 and legislation. Well, <laughs> The best, I mean, the best thing you can do is approach a, a multi-proxy approach. So you have your fabrics, you can look at the top of the spirotherm, hoping that, I mean, if it's a very, very old spirotherm, ooh, the top is not going to be a fresher top, but anyway. You, you, you might so have a thin section of the fabrics, draw the microstratigraphy as, uh, you know, like all the details of the stalagmite. Then do your isotopes, trace elements. So not to just the strontium and magnesium, but try to find trace elements that together if you run a principal component analysis, I'm going to give you a story. They might go together. Um, and do what Slivinsky and Stoll did. Look at fluorescence. So use like epifluorescence or uh, 
and, and, and try to see if you have where the organic matter is distributed. If the best thing actually, when you look at the trace element is either you run a rasters of laser ablation ICP MS analysis, or you actually carry out some maps. Uh, you can use the synchrotron if you have access to a synchrotron, or again, it's just a raster. Now, other things you can do. You can push, well, you can actually, if you have access to a transmission electron microscope and what is called a, um, FIB, so it's a SEM equipped with a focus ion beam thinner, just you have select the fabrics. For example, suppose you have a porous fabric, a, a columnar porous fabric, you select it. You carry this, I mean, a FIB is like, is like a few micrometers long and a few micrometers deep but at least you can see the nano sky. So you can see if you have nanocrystals or not. Um, if, because a transmission electron microscope has the EDS, you can see if, for example, you have organics in it or you have inorganic amorphous compound. The beauty of the TEM is that you can see both the image, so the dislocation, then you can take the fraction pattern so you can, know your phase, look at the lattice parameter, so you know whether it is calcite, aragonite, or something different. Or if it is amorphous, you get rings. And then you can get the composition, and then you can get a tiny little map. So if you have the possibility also to do that, so you would have a lot of information on one stalagmite, and then you have to try somehow to compare what you have to, to, to some other archive already published nearby. And so people, people might be satisfied and said, yeah, okay, we understand you cannot, you could not reproduce the data set, but you are doing your best and you are trying at least to connect it with something else. I don't know, I hope, <laughs> it's it's exhaustive enough <laughs> yeah thank you that that was helpful um i think we'll ask one more question and then we'll head into our 15 minute break so this is from the chat um do you also study the petrography of crystals in caves apart from that of stalagmites for example like crystals that are on the floor or in standing water or flowing water sorry if i study uh, if you study like the crystals in caves that aren't just in stalagmites, so oh. like on, um, I don't know, flowstones or just stuff that forms on the walls or floors. Well, yeah, I mean, um, yes. Uh, the the Buzdalaspi example was a stalagmitic flowstone. And uh, so I look, I, I actually tend to look at the crystals that we mostly use with um, as our, we use an archive of paleoclimate reconstruction. But for example, I look also at um, coralloids, which are extremely intriguing because they actually grow through the spherulitic growth. They are very I say out of equilibrium. And as you notice, I study also dolomite and I study subglacial carbonates. And, and the growth pattern seems to be the same, even when you go through subglacial. I mean, carbonates that form under a thousand meter of ice in Antarctica in a little pool. And they grow very slowly. 
and somehow they seem to go through the screw dislocation. So they have something in common with Laghetto. And Laghetto is actually a phreatic spirit then. So each, I think each, each spirit then might have its own way of growth because different mechanisms may act, but there are laws. And so in the end, it's, it's just a matter of knowing that what you find in stalagmites, in flowstone is even worse perhaps, and in coralloids is really uh, striking. These heterogeneous distribution of your trisalamine. So if you look, like let's say, if for example, you are taking the wrong laser ablation scan and you go through one of these uh, places where strontium wouldn't go, you don't see it. But just laterally, strontium may be present and have a different partitioning because it doesn't go in the acute steps, it goes in the obtuse steps. So that's, I think that that's the meaning of the talk. You should, uh, in every spirosome you have, whatever it is, stalagmite, coralloids, stalactites, uh, flowstone, stalagmitic flowstone, uh, efflorescence, it's always a good practice to run a series of scans called trace elements because otherwise you might have the wrong or an unclear idea. I should say it's wrong. Things might be different for isotopes, although Don Di Paolo is working on, I mean, on isotope incorporation on calcite, and he is finding some preferences. Uh, but I mean, isotopes is not exactly my topic. I stick to growth and trace elements. Have I answered? Yeah, um, all right. Yeah, that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to hand it over to Seb now, who will take us into the break. Um, I see in the chat, Sylvia, if you stick around, um, mm -hmm. someone's requesting your, your email. So I, I'd recommend you go look at the chat. So I go, I stop sharing and I go to the chat. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and thank you so much for all the assistance and thank you so much for this opportunity to, to share. <laughs> Thank you again. Mm -hmm.